Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's History at High Noon program, Journey to Salem. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History and we're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, if you enjoy today's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org where you can learn about more upcoming programs, exhibit, and digital resources. Uh, this is also where you can find information about shopping in our wonderful museum shop and joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programs like today's program possible. Uh, we would also like to thank those of you who kindly donated funds towards today's program. Uh, we continue to do our best to keep our programs free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going, and we just continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping tips for today. Uh, we ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program, and to please type any questions or comments that you have for our guest speakers into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of our talk, our intern Bobby will ask the speakers as many of your questions as time allows. So it is my honor to introduce today's speaker. speakers. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Aaron S. Fogelman. Um, Aaron Spencer Fogelman is the Distinguished Research professor, professor in the History Department at Northern Illinois University. His research and teaching interests include forced and free transatlantic migrations, revolution, slavery, religion, and gender in the Atlantic world and early America. He previously taught at the University of South Alabama and has been a Guggenheim Fellow, Distinguished Fulbright Chair at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, and an Alexander Van Humboldt Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for History in Göttingen. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1991, his master's from Albert Ludwig's University in Freiburg, Germany, and his BA from Oklahoma State University. In addition to compiling and co-editing 500 African Voices, a catalog of published accounts by Africans enslaved in the transatlantic slave trade, 1586 to 1936, Philadelphia American Philosophical Society forthcoming. He is also completing a monograph about four centuries of forced and free transatlantic migrations, tentatively entitled Immigrant Voices. Aaron is from Burlington, North Carolina, and now lives with his family in Illinois. Later in our program, we're also going to be joined by Francis Cronlund, Salem College Class of 1998, and Martha Manning, Salem Academy Class of 1973, both of whom actually walked as part of this historical journey from Bethlehem to Salem commemorative walk, celebrating Salem Academy and College's 250th anniversary. And this walk just wrapped up yesterday. Uh, so Dr. Fogelman, I believe that you're going to start us off. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm um, very happy to be here. I've been corresponding with Martha Manning about the walk uh, that uh, several women have been um, reenacting, and we'll hear more about that later, I suppose. Um, but you know, it, it's it's very exciting, and um, it. This is bringing back old memories of working on this project of uh, the Salome Moira diary. And uh, I'm always glad to come back to North Carolina, where I'm from, to talk about such things, even if it's uh, virtually. So I have a PowerPoint for you. Let's see if I can get the share screen to work. There it is. Okay. Um, I hope you can still see me while I talk. Um, I'll switch this off maybe from time to time. So I discovered uh, Salome Mora's travel diary in 1990 in uh, the Moravian archives in Bethlehem. And uh, I've got a picture of them. It was while I was, there's, there's the archives. And um, I spent a lot of time in there working on my dissertation on German immigration, settlement, and political culture in colonial America. And that came out later as a book. You see the cover there. 
Um, the book contains a chapter on radical pietist migrations, uh, especially the Moravians. And um, so I, um, you see a little bit about Salome Moira in this journal, in, journey and in that book as well. To do this, to, to, to work on this um, book, I read all the Moravian travel journals from the colonial period. Those um, from Europe to America and all of those written from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. They're in the archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and also in Hanhut, uh, Germany, and in uh, Wachovia, or Winston-Salem now in North Carolina. And uh, I was reading these for several weeks. It's in, it's in the old script, which looks like that. Uh, it's in German, obviously, but it's also written in the 18th century handwriting, which can be very difficult. And I've been doing this for several weeks and I came across this one, it was yet another, and it had a long title. Um, and so I just sort of skipped over the title. I said, I'll, I'll figure out exactly who this is later. I just want to, I see the date, I see they were in Bethlehem, which is here, and they're going to uh, Wachau, which is Wachovia, you can see that there. And I'll figure out exactly who it was later. And I just started reading. And then I started noticing very unusual things in this diary. I'd never encountered anything like this before. Um, there were, everywhere this group went, people were watching them and following them around, especially men. And I just had never seen that before. And I just kept asking myself, why are all these men following them around? They're just standing and gawking and looking what's going on. So I, I went back and read closely the title of this manuscript. And it says, Diarium der Reise, Gesellschaft von Geschwister Utlis, etc. It lists all these people there from the 2nd of October to the 31st of October. It, they were all women. It was a, a journey of 450 miles with 18 women and older girls and only two men it lasted 30 days. And that's what was so unusual. That's why so many people were coming to watch them on the trail. Um, and that was just stunning. So I started from the beginning again and reread the entire thing, bearing that in mind. And uh, it was just well, as you know, for those of you who have read it, it was just absolutely fascinating. Uh, I found supplemental material in the uh, archives in North Carolina and Wachovia at the Moravian settlement. And this material had was known to other scholars. Um, the diary itself that I found in Bethlehem was a discovery, new discovery. But in Wachovia, there's the commentary by a, a clergy and the Bethabra community uh, and the community diary describing the arrival of this party uh, in uh, Bethabra. And there's also the uh, Lebenslauf or memoir of Salome Moira, which is in the archives in Winston. Um, and uh, you can read that. And uh, I don't know if anyone had studied those much, but they were available and at least some people were aware of them, I think. Um, so I used the, um, this material in Hopeful Journeys, uh, and I noticed back then um, that there were, that published primary sources from non-English women in colonial British North America were extremely rare. So I decided to, um, to publish it. Um, I did it, published it first in German, in this journal called Pietismus und Neuzeit that came out in 1993. And then I translated it and published it in Pennsylvania history, which is what I think some of you have been reading uh, the following year. And uh, the English version uh, is nice if you can't read German for one, but it has pictures. I didn't have pictures 
Uh, I may have had a map in the German version, I can't remember. But I didn't have any of the nice pictures that you see. And also, after working on it for another year, I, I knew a little bit more about what was going on. So the editing and the footnotes and whatnot are a little bit better. But if you want the original uh, German, if you can read German, and you don't have to read the old script, it's a modern typeface, then then you want to go to this journal. If anybody's interested in either of these, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. Okay, um, the diary itself, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, um, it's, it's a detailed, colorful account of the journey from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which you see here, to Bethabara, North Carolina. Um, in uh, 1766, um, it's a it, it it's an it's just a wonderful account of uh, colonial backcountry life on the eve of the revolution, from a female perspective, and that's that's quite rare. This mile away is the single sisters' house in Bethlehem. It's still there. This is where Salome and the others lived before they started their journey to uh, the fabric. And this is a view of the Thabra in the colonial period. The travel party consisted of 11 girls aged 13 to 17, four single women, one married woman, um, and an English preacher. And Just a wife. moment, Dr. Fogelman, if you can click on the slide that you're referring to, because we are stuck on the first slide, but that's all we need. Oh, really? You're yeah. not seeing any of these? We, we're seeing the first slide, but if you wouldn't mind just clicking on this slide on your left slide reader that you are referring to, then we'll be able to see the slide that you oh. are referring to. Okay. I am clicking and it's not working. Let me try this a different okay. way. Um, so you haven't seen any of the slides I've been showing except the first week. We do see your cursor. There you go. If you click right there, there, that's it. That's exactly what we need. So now we can see slide two. Right. Okay, Thank so you. I can't use Sorry to interrupt. Go down this way. So. Okay. Here's the book I referred to. Moravian Archives in Bethlehem. This is where I found her manuscript. This is the uh, first page of the manuscript get a sense of the writing. This is a detail of the title. Diarism, Diarium der Reisegesellschaft und Geschwister Utlis, etc. Here's the, um, actually I published it in German first. There's the German version. And then here's the English version. And as I said, if, if you're interested in either of these, just let me know and I will send it to you. Here's the view of Bethlehem. This is the single sister's house where she lived, Moira and others in the party lived before they started their journey. And this is the view of the Fabra, right about when they got there maybe a little earlier. And here's the travel party, a list. It's, it's in, uh, published in the article as well. <clears throat> okay, so in addition to all these people, um, they had a large wagon, tents, supplies, and nine horses. And uh, not on this list is someone named Brother Holder, Holder, it looks like in English, who came at the last minute, and I speculated he may have gone in secret with the group and sort of snuck along. Um, if you, if you will see him again later in the, uh, in the uh, journal, you could speculate about what that's all about. And if you were making a movie, we could probably do some really interesting things with that aspect of it. All but three of them were um, German speakers, either born in Germany or grew up in a German speaking family and that was their first language. 
in Pennsylvania. Um, four were born in Europe, the rest in North America, all but one of those was in Pennsylvania. One was from Connecticut, as you can see. They, they left Pennsylvania singing. In fact, they sang the entire journey to keep their spirits up. And uh, I, I wonder, uh, Francis and Martha are here who participated in the walk. I, I wonder if that works, singing when you're walking that way to keep your spirits up. Yes, uh, they took works. turns. <laughs> okay. Um, they took turns riding in the wagon. Um, or sometimes when the horses were very tired and it was difficult, they would all walk to relieve the horses. They passed the Ephrata Cloister in um, Pennsylvania um, and some of the nuns came to visit them wearing their habits and, and Moira provides a, a detailed description of them. On the way, they endured cold, fear, threatening encounters with strangers on the trail, swollen feet, blisters, falling off horses, falling off the wagon, sniffles, toothaches, aching joints, wind blowing campfire smoke into their tent, aggressive unenclosed pigs made off of their provisions, wild geese and dogs ran through their camps at night. The river crossings were the most dangerous. Um, it began uh, with the Susquehanna, which in Pennsylvania, which is a wide river. They crossed at Harris Ferry, that's where the, the capital Harrisburg is now. They got halfway across and the winds were so uh, strong and dangerous, they had to turn around and go back and try again later. Uh, if you think about it, with 22 people, nine horses and a wagon on a raft, and the waves are picking up and the wind uh, is pushing you around, that's pretty dangerous. Um, when they were crossing the Roanoke, uh, uh, near the boundary of Virginia, North Carolina. It was a three hour crossing. They nearly crashed into a cliff. And I have some pictures of these river crossings here. That's uh, Harris Ferry. This is um, a little bit earlier. This is, uh, this is the closest to what it, I have to what it, they actually experienced. Um, on the rafts, you have to see a rope going across and uh, an enslaved black man would run the raft. And you just have to pull on the rope to get the draft, raft across the river. And uh, this could be quite dangerous. Here are some other views. Um, this is 19th century. This is a crossing of the James River a century later. But you can see not much has changed, really. Uh, they're starting to build a bridge there. See it? Bridges were primarily an invention of the 19th century. Um, really, especially the second half of the 19th century, mid 19th century to, to later. You had to, until then, um, throughout North America, um, if you wanted to get around, you had to cross rivers, and this is the way you did it, something like this. Um, and uh, it could be terrifying. And this is an engraving uh, um, of the New River in Virginia, which they crossed. It's, it's not the same method, but it gives you some idea of the terrors involved. Um, Few people could swim in the 18th century. So if you fell off the raft, uh, it often meant death. So you had to hang on to that raft. When they crossed the creeks in North Carolina, they clung to the sides of the wagon to get across. Uh, I know that uh, um, Francis and Martha and the others crossed a lot of rivers on their recent trip. But I don't think they had this much trouble. The key, a key dynamic shaping the experience um, of, of this journey was that the large majority of the group were women. Everyone noticed and responded. Um, 
the population, especially the male population, and the along the trail was attracted to 18 teenage girls and young women and only two men. Nearly in nearly every town, crowds of men gathered to watch them, to jeer, to ogle, to provide gentlemanly assistance. It became serious when they were drunk. And in one case, they I, I, a group uh, attempted to kidnap some of the girls and women in the party. Moira includes a number of expressions of, of what it was like in this regard. On October 3rd, she wrote, Die Leute kamen alle aus ihren Häusern und auf den Gassen blieben sie stehen und sagten, Oh, du lieber Gott, wo gehen so viele Weibsleute? The people all came out of their houses and stood watching on the street, saying, God Almighty, where are so many women going? On October 7th, on the on the way to uh, Yorktown, they encountered a man who said, Ich glaube, das ganze Regiment von Weibsleute geht nach Carolina. I believe that's a whole regiment of women folk going to Carolina. On October 20th, she wrote, Es ist doch artig. Um, this was, um, she's, this is uh, a man they encountered uh, on the trail with his family. And this is, and she's writing what he wrote. Uh, es ist doch artig, ihr seid lauter junge Leute und geht euren Gang so stille fort. Ihr guckt euch nicht einmal um, was hinter euch vorgeht. Ihr jollt auch gar nicht, wie sonst der Jugend ihr Gewohnheit ist. It is so nice to see young people making their way so peacefully. You don't even worry about what is behind you. You don't even yell and fuss like most people would be doing. Um, and, um, you know, I wonder, this, this man was there with his family and kids. I wondered what traveling was like with his kids, and it just makes me think, were they hollering out constantly, are we there yet? Are we there yet? That may have been the case. Um, and then uh, Salome wrote on October 25th, We ging zum ersten Mal auf Karolinisches Land und haben uns gefreut, dass uns der liebe Heiland so glücklich durch Virginien gebracht hat. We crossed into Carolina for the first time and rejoiced that our dear Savior brought us happily through Virginia. Um, you know, I, I don't know if many of you read German. Maybe a few of you can, but it, this is the 18th century before a lot of standardization in language and grammar and that sort of thing. And um, this is what it's like. You. Um, you see what you might think are misspellings and bad grammar, but it's not. It's just the nature of the language. She actually, for the period, uh, Salome Moira wrote pretty well, and she had good handwritings also. Um, there's one example uh, on October 10th where uh, talking about all the men that, that came to bother them on the trail. She said on that day, uh, several men came and talked nonsense to them, as she put it. So she and the others just pretended they didn't speak English. And I also wonder if this sort of thing happened to Francis and the others when they, are, they were on the trail. Um, it could get serious, though. Uh, and on October 8th, 18th, a part of the group went off course and separated from the main party. And there they encountered what she called some bad company. And that was uh, six men who tried to kidnap them. So they had to call out to Brother Holder, the, the young man who perhaps secretly accompanied them. And he came to the rescue. Um, encounters with enslaved men happened especially in Virginia, and this was also revealing. Uh, it usually occurred at the river crossings from, from the Potomac to the Roanoke. And initially, uh, Moira's attitudes toward black people she encountered were quite negative. And then on October 15th, she wrote that six black people came to the camp at night and were proper. 
and they, they just sat around at the campfire with them for a long time and talked. And the contrast with what happened immediately thereafter was striking. She wrote that three Irishmen came and were bothering them. They insisted on sleeping with the Moravian girls and women and had to be chased away with great difficulty by Brother Utley, the preacher who was with them. In any event, uh, Moira's references to black people she encountered on the trail thereafter were more positive. Like uh, all of uh, the Moravian diarists, Moira disliked Virginia intensely. You just see that throughout um, the, uh, uh, the entries, the long entries for this part of the trip. And this was the case for a number of reasons. For one, this is where the frequent dangerous river crossings took place. Um, there were, in this part of the trip, there were torrential downpours, aggressive wild geese and unenclosed pigs that raided their camp at night. There were no Moravian support communities in North Carolina. Everywhere else, Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina, they were there. And also there was a lot of anti-Moravian animosity in Virginia from, from um, Lutheran settlers who were there. Lots of tensions in those days between the two groups. But they kept seeing every day, even when they were soaked in thunderstorms. Um, they walked knee deep in water to relieve the tired, sick horses. All of their goods were soaked. They had no dry clothes for days on end. And then on October 16th, they met a relief party coming from Bethabara. This uplifted their spirits. They brought letters from North Carolina and they took letters that they had written uh, uh, with them uh, as they were going north to uh, Bethlehem. Some of that relief party stayed with them and accompanied them the rest of the way to North Carolina. But when she watched uh, the group head north to Bethlehem, uh, Salome was quite homesick. This shows among other things how um, well known and worn this immigrant trail was because they, the people coming from from the south in the Thabara knew where to go and they, they met up with each other. So there was very clearly a trail there. And she and other Moravian diarists who are on this trail talk about all the migrants and, uh, that were heading south on the trail. It wasn't just Moravians. On October 25th, she wrote, we, uh, we crossed into Carolina for the first time and rejoice that our dear savior brought us happily through Virginia. On October 28th, they reached Corbin Town, which is now called Hillsboro. And there, there was an emotional encounter uh, between, with Moravians who had come to greet them there. And on October 31st, at 3.30 in the afternoon, they arrived in Bethabara. There was a tearful welcome as the band played Euren Eingang Segne Gott, God bless my arrival. There was a love feast, a singing hour. Um, they were shown to their new quarters in the Gemein House, and, the, and that's uh, where the party was lodged, in two rooms and, and a loft in the Gemein House, or the, the common house for them. So um, it's a great story. It's a fun read. But what can we learn from the diary? Um, a few things to consider. Um, British North America in the 1760s was an immigrant society. And the Moravian diary provides details of life among the numerous ethnic and religious groups in the Pennsylvania and Southern back country. Um, but she doesn't say anything about Native Americans. She might have, they were there or it hadn't been very long since they were there. Um, but uh, we get nothing on Native Americans from this diary. But it is especially revealing in three areas. Um, the first is um, regarding um, 18th century overland travel. There were two routes that the migrants were taking in this large migration from the Pennsylvania, Delaware Valley area up here 
southward to the North Carolina backcountry. Um, there were just streams of people heading southward during this people during this period. Um, and uh, until I worked on this project, historians always emphasized that they took the Great Wagon Road, which goes here, you see it, through the Shenandoah Valley. And then you come out at, uh, um, I believe that's Fancy Gap in uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains. These are the Blue Ridge. And then south to North Carolina. But when I was reading all these diaries, I discovered that they were going, the Moravians were going east of the Blue Ridge here, including Salome Moira. The first uh, Moravian party of 1753 that founded the Fabra, they did take the Great Wagon Road. But in every other case, they went east of the Blue Ridge. Um, and um, they, they um, provide just fabulous detail of travel conditions, crossing the river and what it was like. And um, they just note yeah. and over and over in these diaries how they were seeing hundreds of other migrants heading south. Um, so this was a this was a prominent trail along with the Great Wagon Road um, that is was better known to historians. Um, another um, area where the diary is especially revealing is regarding women and travel. Uh, the diary, Moira's diary, re reveals different experiences that women had. Men's diaries usually provide mileage and, and landmarks just over and over again. And it's very important because these were navigational guides for other people to use so they could find their way there. Moira provided instead guidance uh, for spiritual navigation of the landscape, especially in Virginia. And um, that's one of the reasons why their trail was so hard to plot in parts of Virginia because she did not provide too many landmarks. Um, and then um, the diary reveals the additional dangers that women and girls endured especially if they did not uh, travel with very many male escorts. So women usually traveled with men, husbands, fathers. Um, they traveled as couples or family groups. In some cases, uh, you see a, a, a large group women migration in the colonial period. There's an example of this in early French Louisiana, early 18th century, where a ship of uh, women was sent. I, I think it was at least 100, maybe 200. And, and it was hoped that they would be wives for the largely male French colonial population there. Also in 1789, um, the uh, British sent a convict ship with uh, women, women convicts from England to Australia. Um, there were also women's networks that were operated in transatlantic migrations. Um, I've seen this in later times, for example, in New York City in the early 19th century. But here we have a case, a rare case of a group of women who were migrating to build a community or to help build a community, uh, a non-celibate community, not, not like the um, a, a cloister of uh, um, nuns, of which there are examples of that. So the third area where the diary is so revealing is with Moravian migration and community building. The Moravians, um, the Moravian migrations were extremely well organized. They moved in groups usually, not always, but usually or often to and from closed communities from Europe to America or from Pennsylvania to um, um, North Carolina and other places. Um, most of them migrated in choirs and, and choirs, uh, the so-called choirs or the living worship and work groups found in Moravian communities. Each of the choirs kept a diary. And so if it was a, a women's 
choir, for example, the single sisters or the married sisters. A woman would keep that diary. Um, but this is the only case I know of, of a diary for a group of women who are migrating. Community formation in North America by Moravians occurred via a series of overseas uh, and overland migrations. Uh, more than 800 Moravians uh, left Europe to go to North America in the colonial period and at least 265 of those were women or girls. Only one died crossing the Atlantic, which was remarkable for the period. Uh, there are many travel journals describing this, including one by Salome Moira's father, who was a shoemaker from Alsace. Uh, and he came over in, with a large group of Moravians in 1742. In 1753, they founded the community of Bethabara on the 100,000 acre Wachovia track in North Carolina. This was land that was taken from uh, Kiawa, Kiawi and Sisi Paha and other Native American groups. Um, and in the next 18 years, um, more than 200 church members uh, moved uh, from Pennsylvania to Bethabara. 74 of those, about a third, were women and girls, mostly from Pennsylvania. The uh, Moravian support networks in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and North Carolina, uh, where, where they stayed almost every night of the journey, not just Moira's party, but others. Um, but these support networks explain the tremendous success Moravians had as migrants, both transatlantic and overland migrants. But this didn't happen in Virginia. Here, the Moravians tried and failed to start communities. And so migrants passing through this large colony had a lot of trouble, which they wrote about, and Salome wrote about it as well. In 1766, Bethabra requested more settlers from Pennsylvania, and two parties were sent. The first left in September, that was uh, a group of five men and eight boys. And then Moira's group left in October. When her group arrived, the uh, minister wrote in the community diary, now Bethabara is a complete community with all its choirs. By the end of 1766, there were 130 residents in Bethabara. In 1772, Salem began replacing it as the middle point of Moravian life and leadership in Wachovia and Moravian settlements in North Carolina were clearly there to stay. So what happened to Salome Mora and friends um, after they arrived uh, on November 1st, it's kind of an epilogue if you will, on November 1st, the day after arriving, the elders in the community met to discuss how all would be employed. They read aloud letters with instructions from Bethlehem to this effect. Each received a job. Salome began working for the administration. One might speculate that her writing skills had something to do with that. Um, the next day, the engagement of Ana Maria Bendel to Jakob Bonn was announced. Bendel came with the party and, and Jakob Bonn, her uh, fiance, was already there waiting for her to come. By year's end, uh, Brother Schwab had died. Um, this, he was already in North Carolina and Anna Maria Schwab was one of the migrants. She was going to link up with her husband. So after he died, in just a few weeks, uh, she returned to Bethlehem. Salome Moira led a long life of work, worship, marriage, uh, child rearing, while all while moving about in Wachovia. And let me just throw in here, just um, I've gotten a couple of emails just since yesterday by people that I guess are attending today, and they say they're descendants from people who um, uh, were traveling in the party, and uh, they told me all about that, and they told me about 
their ancestors and things they were doing. I'm, I'm just focusing on Salome and a couple of other examples here, but you could do that for any, any one of these groups, the records are there, you could find out what, what happened to them. As for Salome herself, um, in 1768, she was accepted into the Single Sisters Choir. And seven, that means essentially she was considered no longer a girl, but a, a woman, an unmarried woman. In 1772, she moved to Salem. In 1775, she married a man named Tycho Nissen, who was a wagoner who came from Holstein in northern Germany. He arrived in Salem in 1770. They moved to uh, the small community of Friedland. It was an agricultural community. Moravian community in the southern part of the Wachovia tract. In 1780, they returned to Salem, and and shortly thereafter, Nissen became uh, um, ill. So Salome worked as a tailor to support them. She had learned that trade in Bethlehem. Um, her husband died in 1789. So essentially, she worked for nine years to support them. After he died. Uh, she remarried a man named Abraham Hessler, who was an American-born minister who had moved to Bethab, and then they moved to Bethabra. He died in 1793, and she returned to Salem and helped found the Community Girls School, which I think might be the forerunner of Salem Academy, and I know several of you attended Salem Academy, it's still there. In 1821, uh, Salome Morla died of breast cancer um, in Salem, and um, she's buried in the uh, God's Acre, Gottes Ecke, there, which you can see, there's her tombstone. And uh, she left behind three children. Um, one preceded her in death, and 12 grandchildren, when she died. And she also left behind a diary that is a treasure for all of us to enjoy centuries later. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And uh, I'm not sure how we're doing this. If we're going to hear from the other two panelists first, I think we are, yeah. so. We are. Thank you so much, Dr. Fogelman. That was incredible. Um, I can't wait to, to deep dive further into that <laughs> and research um, all those wonderful stories. Uh, yes, so now, as I said earlier, um, we are going to be joined by um, two ladies who actually participated in this incredible walk, um, Frances Cronland and Martha Manning. Um, so ladies, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just share and tell us all about your experience. Well, thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Dr. Fogelman. Truly appreciate being a guest um, here at the North Carolina Museum of History. I, I live in Raleigh. And uh, while I'm not a native of Raleigh, um, it sure feels good to be back home in Raleigh and uh, to be sharing uh, part of my morning with you. So uh, just as you mentioned, I was one of the five through walkers who uh, represented Salem Academy and College by walking from Bethlehem all the way down to Hillsboro and then uh, finally went west to Winston-Salem. Um, we kind of joked around a lot that as we were walking and singing. We were doing a lot of singing and joking. Uh, thank goodness for karaoke on the phone because we were making up our own lyrics to songs we sort of thought we knew. And uh, if it hadn't been for that, we would have just reinforced those misunderstood re lyrics the whole time. But uh, we kept joking the whole time that it's, it's still almost autumn. We're almost seeing the leaves changing. This is great. Pretty soon it'll really blow up, I'm pretty sure. And then we realized, no, we keep changing uh, where we are in autumn. We keep moving south. So we were the first week of autumn for three weeks until we got to Hillsboro, um, historic Corbin town. And uh, then finally we were moving west and we could finally enjoy the second week of autumn for the first time. And the leaves really started changing um, and it started getting cooler for us. Uh, so. Uh, but yeah, we answer, I saw a couple questions in the chat. Feel free to put any questions you'd like in the chat and I'll answer them. 
Uh, but what we, uh, what we figured out along the way was that yes, what works is uh, taking breaks. We averaged somewhere between 18 to 23 miles a day on foot. We had a support van that uh, would kind of get ahead of us by um, about a mile and then we would kind of catch up to the van and then the van would get ahead of us by another mile. And sometimes the van would just kind of come back to us as well um, to, so, to come back to us as well, just to check on us. Um, and then also at turn points, just to make sure we didn't get lost and take the wrong turn. There was one occurrence in which um, we were part of a reconnaissance mission. All of a sudden the van showed up and said, get in, you're in the wrong place. And so we all jumped in the van and uh, because apparently the Google map that we'd been using uh, decided to change courses on us and we didn't know it. And uh, so we got redirected by our support van that day. And then another day, a big, uh, incredible um, rainstorm came down on us, just a, just a hard sell fast. And we were in Halifax County, uh, Virginia, which is timber. And we were on winding roads and we had a lot of uh, timber tractor trailers moving timber through these county roads we were on. So it was tricky. There was no shoulder. There was really nowhere to jump to. And then all of a sudden we had a rainstorm. So same thing, a big reconnaissance mission. We felt like we were in some movie. The van showed up and said, we're closing the course, get in the van. <laughs> so we got in the van. Um, and then on another occasion, we were on the High Bridge Trail up in Virginia, which um, goes over the Appomattox River near uh, Farmville. And uh, we heard gunshots and they were shotguns and uh, which was curious to us. We were actually at the time near Prospect, Virginia. We were in um, a state park. I thought for sure that everything should be fine. And, but we all confirmed with each other. That was shotguns, wasn't it? Do you think it was shotguns? Do you know what a shotgun sound like? I think it's a shotgun. And then um, not three minutes later, we heard shotguns again. They were very close and we could see the hunters kind of in the woods near us. And so we all pulled out our whistles um, that we had with us. Thank goodness, Lucy Rose and I both still had our whistles. I'd never used my whistles in nine years of being out doing trails and, and running and walking, never had to blow it before. But this time I wanted somebody to know where I was. And so um, blew it and they stopped shooting their shotguns. I don't know what the story was there. Um, and something similar when a hunting party came through on a different day, I, not the same county, and it turned out we were in a uh, quail hunting reserve area and they wanted us to move along, please. So uh, we were on a, a road and we weren't trespassing, but they just knew that it was a bad idea for us to be out walking. So we all wore our safety vests um, that day. But uh, in answer to uh, some of the comments, I think you made Dr. Fogelman about uh, the journals that other men wrote um, and how maybe it was different when a female was writing her journal on her travels. Something that all of us noticed when we were stopped and we were stopped a lot along the way about who are you, where are you going, what are you doing, what's your story, what's the walk for today? And um, thinking that it was, you know, a 5K or something like that, that we were, we were doing to bring awareness to something. We gladly told them our story. We had our QR code um, on us that we could give them so that they could look up what we were doing. And um, there, the men who stopped us always had the same question. I say always, I want to say nine times out of 10. They always had the same question, which was, oh, you watch, you're from Pennsylvania. You're on your way to Hillsboro or what road are you taking? Oh, you shouldn't take that road. What you should do is, and they would completely rearrange our navigation. When we had all mapped out, we didn't actually ask for solicitation of feedback. And, um, but they heard where we were going. They were very curious about what road we were planning to turn on next too, and how we were planning to get to the hotel that we told them that we were generally heading towards what town we were in. None of the women asked us what road we were taking. Uh, none, zero. None of them wanted to know uh, how we plan to get there. They all wanted to know, how are you taking care of each other? How are you taking care of your feet? What are you eating tonight? They wanted to know how we were doing to take care of ourselves. Now, maybe men don't feel comfortable asking women that they don't know how your feet feeling, but all the men did want to know, what road are you taking? So we found that to be interesting. Um, another interesting point of note, you know, in 2021, you would think this wouldn't necessarily be the case, but 
there were at least 10 days of our 28 days of the 500 mile portion of our journey that there were no bathrooms during the day. So we were effectively doing a county a day and going from a town to a town. So we'd walk from a town to a town because that's where the hotels are is in a town. So we would leave a town that would have restaurants and buildings, maybe a gas station. And then we'd be on unpainted county roads for most of the 18 miles that day. No bathrooms, no place to um, get a sandwich. So we packed picnic lunches and we um, learned how to use a tree very well. And uh, we looked out for each other in that regard. And you would think that, uh, you know, I don't know, things would be a little bit more populated, but I'll tell you not much probably has changed in Virginia in 250 years for some of those sections. So, um, so Annie asks me in the chat, what are the kind of conversations you had? What did you learn about one another? Well, none of us knew each other, the five of us that signed up for this. Um, but we all said, we really bonded very quickly. We liked each other and we all got along. And I think the reason why is if anybody's gonna sign up for a 500 mile journey, that's somebody I wanna hang out with. So we all uh, bonded, I think over uh, four of us were previous marathoners. Um, one of us had hiked the entire Appalachian Trail uh, by herself, um, had just had done several other trails along the Pacific coast. And uh, we learned from each other about what are, you know, what, what, what are kind of, what's your suck, you know, care preferences, you know, what kind of food do you find travels well? So um, Annette asked, would you do it again? Yes, absolutely. In fact, what I said was uh, every morning on the actual trail, as I woke up this morning was tough because yesterday we ended and now today I'm back to um, 2021. I said, every day, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing right now. And yes, the day before yesterday, when we landed in Bethabara, I really wanted to just turn around and walk right back to Bethlehem. I wanted to do it all over again right now. Um, I wasn't ready to come back to, um, uh, even though I have a very comfortable, happy life here in Raleigh, um, coming back to my family, coming back to every day. There's just no, nothing like being out in nature all day long with friends. And I would just encourage everybody to get their trail legs on. It took us, I think we all said about seven days until we felt like we could handle 18 to 22 miles a day. Um, and we did all train for it. Um, and training for it was, was not easy. We did it on Strava. I don't know if I'm able to share my screen. I am able to share my screen. Um, but this is um, roughly, we use Strava. This is a heat map. Um, I don't know if y'all can see it. Somebody give me a head. Martha, give me a, a thumbs up. Are you able to see a map that I'm sharing right now? Great. So this is a heat map that shows, um, ignore the numbers. That's just the number of Strava activities I recorded that day and where, but this kind of, this is Bethlehem. And we made our way all the way down, you know, through Maryland. It was an exciting, exciting day when we got into Maryland. Um, the fellow who was outside, who lives physically on the Pennsylvania, Maryland line. It was a Sunday morning and he came outside on his front porch when we were taking pictures in front of the sign welcoming us in to uh, Maryland and he came out and he's wearing his pajamas and he had his cup of coffee in his hand and he said, do y'all want to get a picture with my two flags, my Maryland and my, my Pennsylvania flag? I got both of them here. Let me put them out for you. And he put them out for us and we thanked him and we told him about our story. And um, I said, go back to your Sunday morning. We're going to keep going. That was an exciting day. Um, and then also crossing over the Potomac into Virginia was exciting. You know, we only covered two counties in Maryland. So we, we managed to cover the whole state of Maryland in about three days by doing two counties. But crossing over the Potomac um, and then all the way down through the middle, middle, middle of um, uh, Virginia. Very, very, very different once we got to Hillsboro. Once we got to Hillsboro. We just felt like we were already here. We made it. And for those of you who are wondering, if you want to repeat anything that we've done, you can follow um, the information for walkers on our website. You can look at any one of the days um, and then you can pull up the map that we physically followed on that day. This particular day, I loved maybe the most personal reasons. It just felt good to me. Um, but if you click on it, you, you'd be able to see, you know, really what that looked like. And in this case, 
you know, it was a mostly downhill day. Uh, I love those downhill days. And uh, this whole section from Mount Laurel all the way down 621, 609, we had these incredible views of the George Washington Mountains. We could still see a little bit of the Shenandoahs. We were up on ridge lines here and it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, we, we, we just didn't want the day, the whole experience to stop. We just enjoyed being with one another so much. And training was just very, very lonely. Um, doing things by yourself made me think I wouldn't be able to do the journey. I mean, I did 20 miles regularly and I would do sometimes back to back on a Saturday and Sunday, but I completely thought I wouldn't be able to do this journey of 500 miles because it, we took no breaks every day, 18 to 22 miles. And it's completely different when you're surrounded by other people and you're on a common mission together. You have a common purpose together. We really drew from each other's strength and we also commiserated together and did, for all of us to be able to say that hill needs to just stay behind us and, uh, and really, really drew on each other. So it was like being back in college in that way. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Martha. I, I hope I covered this. I, sorry, I'm unprepared. I, did, I just got off the trail yesterday. But, um, but if you have anything you'd like to add, Martha, and if anybody has any other questions, happy to answer them in the chat. Martha, you're on mute. Francie, thank you. You just made this come alive for us. And I, I love hearing this. So I would just say that I was part of the planning committee um, for the route, the history of the route. And so Aaron, you know, there. I thought of you every single day for about a year and my, my team members, my husband, Jim Manning and my other fabulous team member, Virginia Hart, we worked to, to try to find the route and to try to be as historically uh, accurate as we could. So, so that Francie and all the walkers would, we would know that they were walking um, an accurate route. So it, it was just a labor of love. And there's so many people that worked on this and it just shines a light on how much, Salem Academy and college mean to alumni and they just, you know, they're devoted to it. So it was, it was just a wonderful experience, extraordinary four weeks, the most extraordinary. And, you know, it's Francis and the, and the three walkers that are just, you know, they'll be in the history books like Salome. So. Well, that would be an honor. She sure, <laughs> she sure set the, the bar pretty high. And I, there was one question in the chat that I didn't answer. Was it hard to have new people dropping in and out of your group? And uh, the answer to that was somewhat. Um, so there were a core five of us that walked every day, all day together, but then we would have up to 18 people in a given day who were walking in total. So maybe we would have 13 guests for the day. Um, so we would just fan out a lot more on those days and make sure that everybody had a, a walking buddy and had a great time. Um, I mean, we wanted everybody to have a real recreation of our school's founding. Salem Academy and College was started by some hardworking, thoughtful women of purpose. And we wanted them to feel that part of our history together and have a great time. And um, I think that I think that all the alumni support, and we had a couple brother holders in there, I might add, who showed up and um, surprised us and uh, wanted to be helpful part of our journey and um, quickly realized that we were good and we could we could handle this but uh, we had uh, we had a couple had a couple moments there where we were like okay there's a support fan right there if you need to take a break um, but uh, for the most part uh, it was not difficult to have folks uh, join us it only expanded the fun and made it even better There was another question here. What does this tremendous event say mean to the education of women for today? Martha, do you want to take that question? Um, yeah, I, this event just shows, um, shines a light on Salem Academy and College and uh, our school's uh, dedication, devotion to empowering women and, and, and providing a fantastic education to girls and women. Um, so, you know, I think our future is really bright and uh, th this just reignited our future, I believe. 
there's thank you, Martha. There's a question on the chat. Um, if you did, if you had no support van, phones, GPS, easy snacks, meds along the way, uh, how how would this have been different for you? Well, I'll tell you, there were um, there were two <laughs> half days there where our support van was not available. Um, it was a rental support van and the brakes failed. So we had to go get the, uh, this was in, after we left Blitz, but before we got to the Susquehanna. And the Susquehanna I was most excited about um, because it was the toughest part of, in my opinion, it looked like the journey for Salome and crew. And um, that was the day we had no support van, was the same day that they crossed the Susquehanna and they had trouble too crossing the Susquehanna. I had trouble getting to the Susquehanna. It was ultimately a 23 day miler that day. And um, it, uh, we had no support van. So what we did was we took more breaks. Um, we, we were very well packed. Our bags were heavier than usual and we had to just take a lot more breaks. I think what the support van let us do is just keep going. Um, we could just pop in the support van, get a refill of water, swap out our socks, you know, swap out um, a Band-Aid and then just keep going. Um, but we really had to stop and take a lot more breaks and it took a lot longer um, on those um, two half days where we had no support van. Um, there was a question for me about what was the most difficult part about planning the route. And it was really just trying to figure out where they went in Virginia because we could not find a primary source that would show exactly where they went. And Salome mentions rivers. And so we, but we didn't know what cities they went through. And so that was our most difficult part. We, we um, and we still don't really know that. And Erin, if you have any inside information on that, we'd love to have it. I think I sent you an email right before we started. Uh, yes. About that. And I did find a map from the period that showed some roads there and that was very helpful. Um, and so you look at the river, you know about where they are and you and you look for cartographical or other evidence that shows where was there a ford or where was there just some kind of crossing they're usually noted. And I use that to help figure it out. But <clears throat> I think I got most of it in Virginia, I, I found out about where they were. I was pretty close. And there are a couple of places where I, I had to guess a little bit. So I just, I knew where they were at one point and where they were seven or eight miles later. And I just drew what seemed like a logical line. But yeah. I was able to get pretty close in most cases. That, yeah, that's exactly what we did. I mean, we did exactly the same thing. I just wish we had, could see, you know, sit written down on a piece of paper from somebody's diary, you know, a Moravian's diary, but but we did we did exactly what you said. So I feel pretty good about it. Um how do you how are we going to do this? I, I see several questions in the chat that I might answer, but <clears throat> a moment ago that we'll do questions and answers later. Do we, so, are we yeah, so we're actually going to, we'll take a couple of those now. Um, we're over time, so I don't want to take up, I know you guys are busy, you just got home from this, this huge journey, um, but um, we've got a couple of questions. So our adult programs intern, Bobby, who's uh, a panelist with us, um, he can ask you a, a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up. So Bobby, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, that'd be me. Uh, so I got some of the questions. Most of these are from the first section. Uh, can you speak about why the girls began the journey and were they invited to come to North Carolina? Uh, that's for Dr. Fogelman. Um, well, the, the um, leaders in North Carolina wrote Bethlehem and said, we, we need people. We need uh, a, a boys choir and a young men's choir and we need a um, the girls and young women's choir. Uh, I, with the exception of the the man who was who was married to the woman in Pennsylvania, I don't think they requested specific people. Uh, he wanted his wife to come, obviously. So it was the leadership in Bethlehem that decided who would go and um, talk to the choir leaders and the parents in Bethlehem and, and decided 
And um, in some ways it was considered an honor to be chosen for this. Otherwise it, it, it wasn't, it, it meant leaving your home. Um, and, but it was an adventure. So, yeah. and, uh, uh, another related question we had here was, uh, how would they know that they had crossed in North Carolina? And this was a separate question, but I grouped them together. What did Brother Holder do to protect the women along the route? Um, on, the, on the entry for the day they crossed into North Carolina, it, it corresponded with crossing the Roanoke River. And, and so people either in the area or maybe they even knew in advance, people told them, when you, after you cross the Roanoke, if you follow this trail, you'll be in North Carolina. Um, and and, it, and it, if they didn't know in advance, people they met on the trail who lived there, people who were hunting quail, for example, with their <laughs> shotgun. Uh, <laughs> said, yeah, if you're, you're in North Carolina now, or as soon as you get around that bend or whatever, you'll be there. And the other question was, I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, the specifics of what exactly Brother Holder did to pr provide oh. protection. Yeah, one of the things I noticed reading this diary is they, there were 22 of them, I believe, sometimes more. They did not travel all together as a group. Uh, I don't know how you did this, Francis, but uh, you didn't just see 22 people walking next to their wagon on the trail. They were strung out in little groups. Hmm. Much of the time, just how they did it. And they would try to meet up at nightfall for the camp and stay together. And one of these groups, somewhere in the back country of Virginia, just lost the trail and went astray. And um, they, several men encountered them and just, they said, like, more or less, we're taking you, you're ours, we want you. And they started grabbing them by the hand that grabbed one of them by the waist and were going to carry them off. And they, they were screaming for help and Brother Holder um, came. I don't know if he was armed. You know, there were several of them and only one of him, but uh, she doesn't give any details there, but the presence of one other figure, maybe noting that others could be coming as well in the party was enough to scare these men off. And as far as a definitive primary source for this journey, I guess that would be the diary. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we have a pretty long question here asking about a group of boys that left Bethlehem for Bethabara a couple of weeks before Salabane's group. Do you know if they kept a diary or whether it's been translated? Um, when I was working on this book long ago, I read all of the uh, diaries. I looked everywhere in the archives in Germany, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and I read them all. And um, I was, I saw that I was looking in, in my book here to see if I have it in the bibliography and I, I don't list each one of them. It just says diaries or something. And I, I just don't recall seeing that. I see references to them traveling. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I don't think so. But there are other diaries that you can read. They are available either in Bethlehem or uh, Winston-Salem in the Moravian archives of people traveling, going up and down this trail, mostly down from Pennsylvania to South to North Carolina. In, in this period, you can read those. Some of those have been published. The first one from 1753 was translated and published. That might be the only one. Um, I don't know of any others, but they're there. There's, I, I, I think they're a half a dozen maybe, maybe more, I can't remember. It's a long time ago that I read these. It's the... Uh the Nissan building in downtown Winston-Salem related to Salome's husband. The question asker says that they had the same last name. 
probably a descendant. Uh, say. I don't know. Isn't that also the name of a Japanese uh, firm that builds cars? Nissan, I believe. Nissan. Yeah. I think it's the same spelling. So if it's not that, if if it's if it's some business that say predates the 1960s, then they probably are related. After all your research, was there information missing that you wished had been included? And if so, would you have liked to find it? Would you have liked to find it? Well, you always want to know more. Um, I, I was really fortunate to find this, this one example. Um, but um, I would say it would have been helpful to have more writings like this from women um, for the transatlantic voyage and for the overland voyages. Um, and yeah. And, you know, just thinking about it the last couple of days, it, it would have been helpful to have somebody writing about encounters and meetings or whatever with Native Americans along the trail. Um, things were changing fast. In 20 years earlier, anybody who traveled through this area surely would have been writing a lot about Native Americans. They, they would have been much more present right in this area. And so that, that's part of, part of the reason. I think we've covered uh, every question we have, and uh, we're short on time here, so I will hand it back over to Stacy. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you all so much for joining us today. I would like to say a huge thank you to Dr. Fogelman, to Francis Cronlin, and Martha Manning. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us and your knowledge. What an inspiring story. Um, the, with the first brave young woman to make this harrowing journey and the brave women who participated in this modern day celebration. Um, you all are incredible and we're so lucky to have had you with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I, I enjoy uh, renewing the North Carolina connection and talking about this material. It was nice to uh, see Martha and Francis um, and uh, hear, hear especially Francis talk about all of those things. And uh, you answered a lot of my questions about what it was, what it might've been like. And okay, it's not quite so dangerous, but there are a lot of similarities, I think. And you, you about women making long treks like that together out in nature and walking. And that's very interesting. Highly recommend it. <laughs> And I'll just say, um, somebody put it in the chat, but um, you can have my email. I think I think it's in there. And if you're interested, I'll send you the German or the uh, English versions of the diary or both if you like. Yes, yeah, so I put your uh, email in the chat so that folks can reach out to you. But let me add just one last thing. Sorry, somebody wrote this morning, I forget his name, that he said he's a descendant of Salome Moira. And he just found out about this meeting today and he couldn't come, but he didn't say why. He was really frustrated that he couldn't participate today and he was hoping it was recorded and he could see it then. So, just for that. Yes, so this program is gonna be recorded and it will be on the museum's YouTube channel in five to seven days from today. Um, so as soon as that is, is posted on our YouTube channel. We will send out a thank you note um, to all of you who, who signed up today. Even if you signed up and couldn't join us, it will go out to all of our sign up folks. So you will be able to watch it at your leisure <laughs> as often as you wish. <laughs> right. Um, so yes, thank you guys so much. And thank you to our attendees. Um, we hope that if you enjoyed today's program, you will join us for our next History at High Noon, Even As We Breathe with author Annette Clapsaddle happening Wednesday, November 10th, as we celebrate American Indian Heritage Month. Thank you guys. Take care. Have a lovely rest of your day. Bye.
Bye, Aaron. Bye, Francie. Bye, Stacy. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Dr. Thank Fogelman. You guys.